Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Prime Minister, you're welcome here today uh, at the Centre for Social Justice. I want to uh, remind everybody, not that they knew about this before, but that the CSJ, this is their 20th anniversary. So you're here at a good time, not just because, uh, Prime Minister, you're going to make a very important speech, but also because the Centre for Social Justice has been working uh, with governments of both persuasions, uh, but certainly trying to uh, change the way that people live their lives to get a better life and better outcomes as a result of that. Uh, and this is the 20th year of that. It's worth just reminding ourselves as well uh, that the CSJ, which I set up, was probably in a room about 10% uh, of this. There were four of us. You couldn't swing a cat. Well, you're not meant to. Anyway, I don't think, <clears throat> but, you know, who knows what happened when I wasn't there. But the reality was that was about it, uh, and uh, nobody really wanted to know about us, the story of our lives, uh, but it did change progressively after that, and so much of what we've done has been about that. The five pathways we set, which were uh, getting people out of poverty, is hugely not just about giving more money, but it's much more about structure of lives uh, and the way that you're able to deliver to your lives. And the five pathways that we set them up for was uh, family breakdown and dysfunction, uh, debt, addictions, worklessness, and failed education. And those five pathways seemed to us to constantly be there when people were unable to seek work, unable to get work, in communities that were deprived, riven with drugs and crime, these tended to be key elements of the reasons why people were trapped in this. And that has been the principles of the Centre for Social Justice since and all the reports that we've done. And I want to thank you, Prime Minister, as well, because two particular areas that we've been very strong on, which you have backed and put money behind, one was family hubs. Uh, yes, it's important uh, to uh, make sure that individuals get the right support, but the problem has always been uh, that individuals and families are shunted from one area to another, from health to work and pensions, etc., and nobody really talking to each other about the residual problems. And so supporting family hubs, which I think has been a great success, uh, is thanks to your particular and personal regard for this. And the second one is universal credit, which started here at the Centre for Social Justice, which I then had to take through uh, uh, when I was in power and now exist, I think is a major benefit. But the one thing about it is it tells us all about what's going on in a family household for the first time. Not just individual claims, but the whole household's income is now known to us. We know, therefore, what is the condition of that family rather than the individual. Uh, and uh, the important thing about that was we wanted to set alongside that a thing called family uh, universal support. Uh, universal support is once you now know what the problems in a family are, you can then take other ways to deal with their problems so that they can get back to work, not just be treated as perennially unemployed. And I'm pleased to note, uh, with Mel and yourself, and of course the Chancellor, uh, that uh, you've now put money behind supporting universal support, and I want to thank you very much for that as well. So it's uh, a great privilege for us to have you here, Prime Minister, so welcome and thank you very much indeed. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'd like to talk about the growing number of people who've become economically inactive since the pandemic and the moral mission of reforming welfare to give everyone who can the best possible chance of returning to work. Now, the values of our welfare state are timeless. They're part of our national character of who we are as a country. We're proud to ensure a safety net that is generous for those who genuinely need it and fair to the taxpayers who fund it. We know that there are some with the most severe conditions who will never be able to work, and some who can no longer work because of injury or illness. And they and their loved ones must always have the peace of mind that comes from knowing they will always be supported. But we also have a long-standing view that work is a source of dignity, purpose, of hope. The role of the welfare state should never be merely to provide financial support, as important as that will always be, but to help people overcome whatever barriers they might face to living an independent, fulfilling life. Everyone with the potential should be supported, and not just to earn, but to contribute and belong. And we must never tolerate barriers that hold people back from making their contribution, 
and from sharing in that sense of self-worth that comes from feeling part of being something bigger than ourselves. And that is why this is a moral mission and why the value of work is so central to my vision for welfare reform. And it is fitting to be setting out that vision here at the Centre for Social Justice. Over your 20-year history, you've inspired far-reaching changes to welfare. And I want to pay tribute to you and, of course, your family. Smith, who began that journey of reform in 2010, a journey carried through so ably today by Mel Stride. Because when we arrived in office in 2010, people coming off benefits and into work could lose nine pounds for every 10 they earned, by far the highest marginal tax rate. And that was morally wrong. So we created universal credit to make sure that work always pays. We introduced the national living wage and increased it every year, ending low pay in this country. We're rolling out 30 hours of free childcare for every family over nine months of age. We've halved inflation to make the money you earn worth more. And we've cut workers' national insurance by a third, a £900 tax cut for someone earning the average wage, because it is profoundly wrong that income from work is taxed twice when other forms of income are not. For me, it is a fundamental duty of government to make sure that hard work is always rewarded. I know and you know that you don't get anything in life without hard work. It's the only way to build a better life for ourselves and our family and the only way to build a more prosperous country. But in the period since the pandemic, something has gone wrong. The proportion of people who are economically inactive in Britain is still lower than our international peers, and lower today than in any year under the last Labour government. But since the pandemic, 850,000 more people have joined this group due to long-term sickness. This has wiped out a decade's worth of progress in which the rate had fallen every single year. Now, of those who are economically inactive, fully half say they have depression or anxiety. And most worrying of all, the biggest proportional increase in economic inactivity due to long-term sickness came from young people, those in the prime of their life, just starting out on work and family, instead parked on welfare. Now we should see it as a sign of progress, of course, that people can talk openly about mental health conditions in a way that years ago would have been unthinkable. And I will never dismiss or downplay the illnesses people have. Anyone who has suffered mental ill health or had family and friends who have knows that these conditions are real and they matter. But just as it would be wrong to dismiss this growing trend, so it would be wrong to merely sit back and accept it. Because it's too hard, too controversial, or for fear of causing offence. Doing so would let down many of the people our welfare system was designed to help. Because if you believe, as I do, that work gives you the chance not just to earn, but to contribute, to belong, to overcome feelings of loneliness and social isolation, and if you believe, as I do, the growing body of evidence that good work can actually improve mental and physical health, then it becomes clear we need to be more ambitious about helping people back to work. And more honest, about the risk of over-medicalising the everyday challenges and worries of life. Fail to address this, and we risk not only letting those people down, but creating a deep sense of unfairness amongst those whose taxes fund our social safety net in a way that risks undermining trust and consent in that very system. We can't stand for that. And of course, the situation as it is, is economically unsustainable. We can't lose so many people from our workforce whose contributions could help to drive growth. And there's no sustainable way to achieve our goal of bringing down migration levels, which are just too high, without giving more of our own people the skills, incentives and support to get off welfare and back into work. And we can't afford such a spiralling increase in the welfare bill and the irresponsible burden that will place on this and future generations of taxpayers. We now spend £69 
billion pounds on benefits for people of working age with a disability or health condition. That's more than our entire school's budget, more than our transport budget, more than our policing budget. And spending on personal independence payments alone is forecast to increase by more than 50% over the next four years. Let me just repeat that. If we do not change, it will increase by more than 50% in just four years. That's not right. It's not sustainable, and it's not fair on the taxpayers who fund it. So, in the next Parliament, a Conservative government will significantly reform and control welfare. Now, this is not about making our safety net less generous or imposing a blanket freeze on all benefits, as some have suggested. I'm not prepared to balance the books on the backs of the most vulnerable. Instead, the critical questions are about eligibility, about who should be entitled to support and what kind of support best matches their needs. And to answer these questions, I want to set out today five conservative reforms for a new welfare settlement for Britain. First, we must be more ambitious in assessing people's potential for work. Right now, the gateway to ill health benefits is writing too many off, leaving them on the wrong type of support and with no expectation of trying to find a job with all the advantages that that brings. In 2011, 20% of those doing a work capability assessment were deemed unfit to work. But the latest figure now stands at 65%. That's wrong. People are not three times sicker than they were a decade ago. And the world of work has changed dramatically. Now, of course, those with serious debilitating conditions should never be expected to work. But if you have a low-level mobility issue, your employer could make reasonable adjustments, perhaps including adaptations to enable you to work from home. And if you're feeling anxious or depressed, then of course you should get the support and treatment you need to manage your condition. But that doesn't mean we should assume you can't engage in work. That's not going to help you. And it's not fair on everyone else either. So we're going to tighten up the work capability assessment such that hundreds of thousands of benefit recipients with less severe conditions will now be expected to engage in the world of work and be supported to do so. Second, just as we help move people from welfare into work, we've got to do more to stop people going from work to welfare. Now, the whole point of replacing the sick note with the fit note was to stop so many people just being signed off as sick. Instead of being told you're not fit for work, the fit note provided the option to say that you may be fit for work with advice about what you can do and what adaptions or support would enable you to stay in or return to work quickly. 11 million of these fit notes were issued last year alone. But what proportion were signed maybe fit for work? Just 6%. That's right. A staggering 94% of those signed off sick were simply written off as not fit for work. Well, that's not right. And it was never the intention. We don't just need to change the sick note. We need to change the sick note culture so that the default becomes what work you can do, not what you can't. Building on the pilots that we've already started, we're going to design a new system where people have easy and rapid access to specialised work and health support to help them back to work from the very first FitNote conversation. And part of the problem is that it may not be reasonable to ask GPs, who are perfectly very busy at the moment, assess whether their own patients are fit for work. It too often puts them in an impossible situation where they know that refusal to sign somebody off will harm that precious relationship with their patient. So we're also going to test shifting the responsibility for assessment from GPs and giving it to specialist work and health professionals who have the dedicated time to provide an objective assessment of someone's ability to work and the tailored support that they need to do so. Third, for those who could work with the right support, we should have higher expectations of them in return for receiving benefits. Because when the taxpayer is supporting you to get back on your feet, you have an obligation to put in the hours. 
And if you do not make that effort, you can't expect the same level of benefits. It used to be that if you worked just nine hours a week, you'd get full benefits without needing to look for additional work. That's not right. Because if you can work more, you should. So we're changing the rules. Anyone working less than half a full-time week will now have to try and find extra work in return for claiming benefits. And we'll accelerate moving people from legacy benefits onto universal credit to give them more access to the world of work. Now, one of my other big concerns about the system is that the longer you stay on welfare, the harder it can be to go back to work. Around half a million people have been unemployed for six months. And well over a quarter of a million have been unemployed for 12 months. These are people with no medical conditions that prevent them from working and who will have benefited from intensive employment support and training programs. There is no reason these people should not be in work, especially when we have almost a million job vacancies. So we will now look at options to strengthen our regime. Anyone who doesn't comply with the conditions set by their work coach, such as accepting an available job, will, after 12 months, have their claim closed and their benefits removed entirely. Because unemployment support should be a safety net, never a lifestyle choice. Fourth, we need to match the support people need to the actual conditions they have and help people live independently and remove the barriers they face. But we need to look again at how we do this through personal independence payments. I worry about it being misused. Now, its purpose is to contribute to the extra cost people face as they go about their daily lives. Take, for example, those who need money for aids or assistance with things like handrails or stair lifts. Often they're already available at low cost or free from the NHS or local authorities. And they're one-off costs. So it probably isn't right that we're paying an ongoing amount every year. We also need to look specifically at the way personal independence payments support those with mental health conditions. Since 2019, the number of people claiming PIP, citing anxiety or depression as their main condition, has doubled, with over 5,000 new awards on average every single month. But for all the challenges they face, it's not clear they have the same degree of increased living costs as those with physical conditions. And the whole system is undermined by the way people are asked to make subjective and unverifiable claims about their capability. So, in the coming days, we will publish a consultation on how we move away from that to a more objective and rigorous approach that focuses support on those with the greatest needs and extra costs. We will do that by being more precise about the type and severity of mental health conditions that should be eligible for PIP. We'll consider linking that assessment more closely to a person's actual condition and requiring greater medical evidence to substantiate a claim. All of which will make the system fairer and harder to exploit. And we'll also consider whether some people with mental health conditions should get PIP in the same way through cash transfers or whether they'd actually be better supported to lead happier, healthier and more independent lives through access to treatment, like talking therapies or respite care. I want to be completely clear about what I'm saying here. This is not about making the welfare system less generous to people who face very real extra costs from mental health conditions. For those with the greatest needs, we actually want to make it easier to access with fewer requirements. And beyond the welfare system, we're delivering the largest expansion in mental health services in a generation, with almost £5 billion of extra funding over the past five years, and a near doubling of mental health training places. But our overall approach is about saying that people with less severe mental health conditions should be expected to engage in the world of work. And fifth, we can't allow fraudsters to exploit the natural compassion and generosity of the British people. We've already cracked down on thousands of people wrongly claiming universal credit, including those not self-reporting earnings or hiding capital. 
and will save the taxpayer £600 million by legislating to access vital data from third parties like banks. Just this month, DWP secured guilty verdicts against the Bulgarian gang, caught making around 6,000 fraudulent claims, including by hiding behind a corner shop in North London. And we're going further. We're using all the developments in modern technology, including artificial intelligence, to crack down on exploitation in the welfare system that's taking advantage of the hard-working taxpayers who fund it. We are preparing a new fraud bill for the next parliament, which will align DWP with HMRC, so that we treat benefit fraud like tax fraud, with new powers to make seizures and arrests, and will also enable penalties to be applied to a wider set of fraudsters through a new civil penalty. Because when people see others in their community gaming the system that their taxes pay, it erodes support for the very principle of the welfare state. Now, in conclusion, some people no doubt will hear this speech and accuse me of lacking compassion, of not understanding the barriers people face in their everyday lives. But the exact opposite is true. There is nothing compassionate about leaving a generation of young people to sit alone in the dark before a flickering screen, watching as their dreams slip further from reach every passing day. And there is nothing fair about expecting taxpayers to support those who could work but choose not to. It doesn't have to be like this. We can change. We must change. The opportunities to work are there, thanks to an economic plan that has created almost a million job vacancies. The rewards for working are there, thanks to our tax cuts and increases to the national living wage. And now, if we can deliver the vision for welfare that I've set out today, then we can finally fulfill our moral mission to restore hope and give back to everyone who can the dignity, purpose and meaning that comes from work. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got lots of time for some questions from the media. I'd like to try and get through as many as we can. So if I could ask you to try and keep it to one question, that will help. Uh, and if I could start with ITV. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, on personal independence payments, 1.9 million people with mental health issues are currently sitting on a waiting list. Surely that's not the right moment to float replacing their cash benefits with access to treatment that they'll be worried they can't get. And I'm sorry, but I do just want to ask for a response to the Israeli strikes on Iran. Yeah, um, thanks, Anishka. Uh, we take mental health incredibly seriously, which is why we're investing record amounts into mental health services and treatment. If you look at what's happened, funding for mental health services has actually exceeded the increase that was set out a few years ago in the NHS's long-term plan. So it went up 10% last year. NHS mental health services are right now treating a record number of adults. We've rolled out mental health support in communities, in schools, and our actually world-leading talking therapies um, has been given extra funding and has I think, a very successful recovery rate and that's being expanded to more people and we're preparing for the long term as well the recently announced long term workforce plan for the NHS trains a near, well, a near doubling of the number of mental health nurse training places are created through that so I think that should give you a sense of our commitment to supporting those with mental health conditions as I said record amounts going in and a plan to continually expand them um, but I do think it's, it's right to make sure that our welfare system is supporting those who need it the most in the way that we intended it to. And you just have to look at the numbers. You know, over half of all the people who joined that group of the economically inactive last year uh, were citing mental health or anxiety as the main reason. Now, of course, we want to get people the support and the treatment they need uh, with those conditions. Uh, but I do think it's right that the welfare system doesn't over medicalize you know, the everyday challenges and worries of life, especially because I believe very strongly in the evidence support 
work is good for people's mental health, right? There's increasing evidence and you cite a range of different studies that actually people being in work see huge improvements in their overall health and especially their mental health. So we're letting those people down if we persist with a system which at the moment is writing far too many of them off as just simply not able to work when we know that work will be very good for them. And you've seen this massive increase since the pandemic, most worryingly, I think for all of us amongst young people, and that can't be right. Right? That's an enormous loss of potential, and we don't want to lose all those people's potential. We want to support them so that they can have, as I described, you know, the purpose, the meaning, the hope that comes from good work. And that's why I think it is right to look again at how the work capability assessment works, and that's why we're going to tighten up the conditions there, but also how PIP supports those with mental health conditions. And it is, I think, the right thing to consider whether those people with less severe conditions do of course get the treatment and support they need and the right way to do that might not be through cash transfers. And it may also not be the case that the system as it is set up today, in the way that it treats people with this one size fits all model, is actually doing the right thing. There's a range of conditions and severities that people have and the impact on their daily living costs. And we need to be a bit more specific about that and actually ask ourselves, well, hang on, is everyone seeing these extra costs in their day-to-day -day living in the same way, particularly when it comes to mental health conditions? And I think, as I said, the numbers speak for themselves. If we don't do anything, the PIP bill alone is forecast to increase by 50% in just four years. And I don't think anyone sitting here thinks that is right, sustainable or fair. Um, and as I said, particularly when we think that work is good for people, it's, uh, it's the right thing to do to, tr uh, to try and tackle this in the way that I've set out. Um, but with the situation overnight, uh, as you would appreciate, it's a developing situation. It wouldn't be right for me to speculate until the facts become clear and we're working to confirm the details together with allies. You know, we have condemned Iran's reckless and dangerous barrage of missiles against Israel on Saturday, and Israel absolutely has the right to self-defense. Uh, but as I said to Prime Minister Netanyahu when I spoke to him last week, and more generally, significant escalation is not in anyone's interest. What we want to see is calm heads prevail across the region. Uh, next, we go to LBC. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Um, I just wanted to ask, Job Centre staff have already reported across the country unsustainable workloads and huge backlogs. Under this plan, they're going to have 400,000 more people to support into work. That is a lot of people. Are you confident that they're going to be able to manage that? And I have to ask as well, should Mark Menzies quit as an MP? So, on, uh, let me just take the second one first. It's right that Mark en Menzies has resigned the Conservative Whip. He's been suspended from his position as a trade envoy whilst the investigations into those allegations continue. You know, for our part, I can't comment on our ongoing investigation while it's happening, and uh, he's no longer a Conservative MP, as I said. Now, with regard to, to work coaches, they do a fantastic job, actually, and they deserve an enormous amount of our praise um, for what they do. Because um, they're doing something actually incredible. I mean, they are transforming people's lives, right? Moving someone off welfare into work is an incredibly special moment, right? And any of us who have worked with them and heard about those stories or talked to constituents, colleagues in our communities who have made that transition will know what an incredible moment it is. Ian and I were talking about that just before we came in, and Ian has spoken about it so eloquently in the past. You know, work is an enormous force for good. You know, I believe this very strongly. It actually, when I first created the furlough scheme and people asked me about it, what drove me to do that was my belief in the fundamental importance of work to people's lives. It gives you purpose. It gives you dignity. It gives you pride. It gives you a sense of belonging. Uh, it gives you hope. And it's not just about, obviously, the financial security that it brings. It's about all those other things that strengthen your life. And, you know, we don't get anywhere in life without working, whether it's individuals, our family, or indeed the country. That's why, you know, I created the furlough scheme because jobs are so important to me. And it's why this agenda for welfare reform is so important to me. And the people on the front line who are doing it are our work coaches. They are the people that are supporting people into work and they deserve an enormous amount of thanks and praise for everything they do and rightly championed by Mel. And Mel uh, has worked really well with the Chancellor to secure extra funding 
for all our uh, job coaches and our um, job centres and our work coaches. Ian talked about things like universal support uh, in his opening remarks. So actually, we've invested probably over the last two or three budgets and fiscal events literally billions of pounds into new programmes that go into supporting our work coaches. You know, Mel could explain all the details afterwards. There's universal support, there's work well. All of these things essentially provide work coaches with more resources, more work coaches to support more people, to help them into work. So we've approached this from lots of different ways. It's not just about reform to the welfare system. It's about proactive support, wraparound support. We've also invested in training as well. So actually, for all the people that we want to help, they have now access to completely free training, level two, level three qualifications, skills boot camps, all of these initiatives designed to help them get into work. So we are wrapping our arms around these people and helping them with everything that we've got. And we're also using new technology. And I talked a little bit about AI on the fraud side, but we're also using technology to act as a co-pilot, essentially, for work coaches uh, so that it can make their lives easier. And we've already started rolling that out. The results are incredible in the amount of time that it saves work coaches. We've got more to do. But that's why it's so important that you've got, in this government, a government that understands the potential of technology to transform public services. You know, we all want more out of public services, and we'd all prefer to pay less taxes. You know, one way to square that circle is to make sure that we use technology to drive our productivity. And actually, the work Mel's doing across our job centres is a great example of that. And that's only going to improve over time. Uh, and that's why actually using AI and other technologies, making work coaches' life easier, saving them uh, from the bureaucracy that some of the, they're going through with the forms, um, is paying real dividends and, and will only make life easier going forward. Uh, next, we go to the BBC. Vicky Young, BBC. Um, could you talk a bit more about the fit notes and the changes you want to make? Who is going to do this instead of GPs? Are there professionals? What training will they get? How will you recruit them, given that there does seem to be an issue with recruitment in uh, the NHS at the moment? And if you're going to have a more tailored service, that will, of course, take up more time and be more complicated. Isn't that going to just add to the backlog? And uh, secondly, why did you wait so long before acting on the serious allegations about Mark Menzies? So on, on Mark Menzies, I've already addressed that, and as I said, there's an ongoing investigation, so I can't really comment whilst that's ongoing. On, on the fit note, the broader point here, before we get into the practicalities of what we're doing is the why, and it's just to remind everyone of what I said, right? When, this, when we went from a sick note to a fit note, the whole point was we were trying to say, hang on, there, there's lots of work people may be able to do. Right? And we need flexibility in this gateway to focus on what people can do, not what they can't. Uh, but that hasn't happened. As I said, 94% of the 11 million fit notes last year were not fit for work. Right? So this idea that we would have more flexibility, focus more on what people may be able to do, hasn't happened. And that's why I think it's right that we look at this. Um, so there, we've already started pilots. And so Mel's already been rolling out some pilots across the country to trial different ways in local areas. Uh, today we're publishing our call for evidence, because I'm not saying I'm standing here today with the precise answer of what it's going to look like, but we're going to ask people's views, we're going to trial a range of different things. But I do think that there is an argument for moving away, as I said, from GPs doing this, who obviously there's a lot of demands on GPs, um, and it may be that this is better done by other professionals. Also, that is it, it, GPs have a quite special relationship with their patients, and inserting this into it puts them sometimes in, and you talk to them in a difficult position because they don't want to damage that relationship with their patient, and it may be harder for them to, to be as objective. And I know, actually, I think the Royal College of uh, General Practitioners has, has kind of welcomed the call for evidence today. So that we want to explore different, different models. Uh, there's a range of different options you can do, but we want to figure out, well, what's a system that's efficient, um, that's got the right number, you know, the right expertise and skills of people to make these objective assessments and do it in a way that is fair, that is also focused on figuring out what people can do, not what they can't, so that we change the culture around this whole, uh, this whole process. Um, so that, that's the approach on fit notes. As I said, uh, call for evidence is published today, um, but I think there's a very strong argument for changing our current system because it's not delivering on the aims that it originally set out to deliver. And you know, I've, as I said, if you believe, like me, work is a good thing, we've got to have a system and a culture that recognizes that and encourages it, and the current fit note system, unfortunately, is not delivering that for any of us. Uh, next, we go to GB News. Uh, 
Christopher Hope from GB News. Prime Minister, um, is this sick note culture a generational thing? Are you basically saying that Britain's got to pull itself together, go back to work, to older people just get on with it, and younger people don't want to? And can I ask you a question about the Rwanda flights? You now won't say these flights will take off by the end of spring. Will you say well, they'll take off by the end of the summer? So on this question of mental health, I just want to be really clear. I'm not in any way saying that mental health isn't a serious condition. Of course it is, and that's why, as I outlined earlier, we've invested a record amount in it, record amount of people getting treated for it, and it's a very welcome thing that we all can talk and acknowledge mental health issues in a way that we wouldn't or couldn't have done a decade ago. Uh, and look, if you're feeling anxious or depressed, then of course you should get the support and the treatment that you need to manage your conditions. But that doesn't mean that we should assume you can't engage in the world of work because that isn't going to help you when all the evidence says that work can be good for your mental health. And what we need to not do is risk over medicalizing these things when it comes to the welfare system and, and over medicalizing what are essentially the everyday challenges and anxieties of life. Right? That is distinct from a welfare system that recognises people with severe conditions need very specific help and support. You know, for lots of other people with less severe conditions, they can and should be expected to engage in the world of work, and that's why we're going to reform um, the work capability assessments again and look at how PIP treats these conditions. Uh, but this point on young people is important, and I said it should worry all of us. The biggest proportional increase in the group of people who have become economically inactive since the pandemic is young people. Right? That is a tragedy. Right? I, it's enormous waste and loss of human potential. And so as a matter of urgency, we should be wanting to tackle that. And as I said, if you believe very strongly, as I do, that work is good for people, particularly early in their careers in life, then we must look at reforming this system because how it's working at the moment, forget about what it's doing on the money and everything else and it's unsustainable and bad for the economy, it is fundamentally letting these people down um, if we are writing them off rather than helping them get into work because that's probably one of the most positive things we can do for them. Uh, on, on Rwanda, look, the, the very simple thing here is, is that repeatedly everyone has tried to block us from getting this bill through. And, uh, you know, yet again, you saw it this week. Um, you saw, you know, Labour peers blocking us again. And that's enormously frustrating. Everyone's patience with this has run uh, thin. Mine certainly has. Uh, so our intention now is to get this done on Monday. No more prevarication, no more delay. We are going to get this done on Monday and we will sit there and vote until it's done. I think everyone will be able to see that, that there's a clear choice here. You've got a Conservative government that is doing absolutely everything it can to pass this bill so that after that we soon as practically possible can get flights to leave to Rwanda and build that deterrent so that we can stop the boats. And you've got a Labour Party that is doing absolutely everything it can to delay and frustrate in the, us in that aim. I think the British people can see that very clearly, but we're not deterred. We're going to do everything we can to stop the boats. And get, as I said, look, the priority now is to get this bill passed, right? At the end of the day, like, we've got to get this bill passed. And I said now very clearly, we're going to get this done on Monday. We don't want any more prevarication or delay. Enough from the Labour Party. We're going to get this bill passed, and then we will work to get flights off so we can build that deterrent, because that is the only way to resolve this issue. If you care about stopping the boats, you've got to have a deterrent. You've got to have somewhere that you can send people so that they know if they come here illegally, they won't get to stay. It's as simple as that. The bill is the way we're going to deliver that. Uh, next, we'll go to the Daily Mail. Thanks, PM. Uh, Jason goes from the Daily Mail. Um, you, you talk in your speech about uh, removing benefits entirely from uh, long-term unemployed who won't take a job. Um, I mean, that could leave some people destitute. Some of your critics are going to say uh, that that's immoral, not moral. What, what would you say to them? And can I ask you just quickly also about this Ofcom report today showing a large number of kids under the age of seven are on social media. Is that acceptable? And if not, what are you going to do about it? So, look, on this, on this issue that you've mentioned, Jason, I think this is actually it's important we have a very clear and honest conversation about this. You know, welfare should always be a safety net and not a lifestyle choice. Right? I think that's something I believe. I think that's probably something everyone in this room believes. And we've got a situation at the moment where we've got half a million people, around half a million people, who have been on unemployment benefits for six months. A quarter of a million people who have been on benefits for 12 months. Right? At a time when we've got, thanks to our management of the economy, around a million job vacancies. 
right? And these are people who don't have any medical condition that bars them from working. These are people who've benefited from all the support that Mel has put in place and Gillian's put in place with the skill side. So there's an enormous amount of support for these people. No medical conditions while they can't work. And yet we have, as I said, half a million of them who are kind of on benefits for a long time, right? And I worry very much about benefits becoming a lifestyle choice. That is not good, obviously not good for the economy, not good for the public finances and taxpayers. It's not fair, but it's not good for those people if you believe, like I do, that work is the best way to improve their lives. And you talk about their financial circumstances. You know, a, a typical adult moving from unemployment into work will be £7,000 a year better off, thanks to the reforms from universal credit, our tax cuts, the national living wage, £7,000 a year better off. So if you're talking about financial security and destitution, the best thing for that person is to be in work financially as well as all the other benefits it brings their life. And I just think it is a basic matter of fairness, right? If the taxpayer is supporting you with all of the help you need, the training, the counselling, the CV advice, the skills boot camps, the jobs everywhere, you know, your work coach should be in a position to say, hang on, at 12 months, if you haven't done the things that I've asked you to do, including accepting a job, if there's a perfectly acceptable job available, then it is entirely reasonable and fair to say, well, that's that, right? Your benefits are stopping, right? After having provided all that support, jobs are available, the taxpayer is funding this. We all believe in a welfare state that provides security and a safety net, but it shouldn't provide a lifestyle choice. I think that is a basic element of fairness to me. Uh, and the work coach is the one with the, who make the claimant commitments, so they obviously can tailor the circumstances, but there might be extenuating circumstances here or there in individual hard cases. But this fundamental principle that if after 12 months of all this support that you're getting at a time where there are jobs are available, uh, you're still saying no or not taking up that work. It just doesn't seem right or fair to me that that should be allowed to continue and that that welfare should be a lifestyle choice. It's just simply not fair on everyone else. It undermines, actually, the very compassionate welfare system that all of us believe in. And that's why I think it's right that we do that. Uh, and that's why we'll take those reforms forward. Um, and so that's what a future Conservative government will deliver in a reform welfare system. Uh, next, if we go... Oh, right, yes. Well, we're drifting into multiple questions, I notice, uh, lately. Um, so on, uh, on, on this, so I have, look, I've obviously seen all the, I haven't seen all the details of the report. Look, my general views on this, I've, you know, I have two young girls who are a little, obviously a little bit older than the ages that you mentioned. You know, most platforms already don't allow under-13s onto their sites, right? So, look, just, you know, children that young you know, shouldn't be having access to phones full stop, right, let alone uh, social media. I think that's uh, pretty clear. I think it's just, as a parent, more than anything else, I worry about all these issues, right? As they're two young girls, you know, they're at that age, and that's why our Online Safety Act is so important. And I guess actually we should take a moment to recognise the leadership that the UK has shown on this issue. We're one of the first countries in the world to confront these quite tricky challenges uh, and pass the Online Safety Act. I think it's really incumbent now that we get on and implement that act. The regulator has got work to do. And that act is designed to make sure that children are protected from seeing harmful content online. The, the regulator will be able to fine these big social media companies up to 10% of their global turnover if they don't comply with the rules. I said that is tough and appropriate because we do want to be able to keep our children safe online just as we want to keep them safe in the physical world um, and that's what that that bill does and we're just going to make sure that we deliver that as quickly as possible uh, next go, go to the sun hi prime minister noah hoffman from the sun while boris johnson was being probed by the police over potential lockdown breaches. Angela Rayner suggested that he should stand aside. Is it your view that she should practice what she preaches and stand aside as well? Uh, well, look, when it comes to that issue, I, I think I made my point of view clear on, on Wednesday in Parliament. I think the question actually is for Keir Starmer, right? And the question is for Keir Starmer as to why he's refusing to himself read the advice that seems to exist, why it's not been published, um, and you know, make a decision on this. And I think that actually just displays a, a, a lack of leadership and weakness on his part. Um, there clearly are questions to answer. That's clear for everyone to see. Um, and he, you know, rather than kind of hiding behind his team, just actually read the advice himself, publish the advice, and, and clear this up. Obviously, I'm not going to comment on ongoing police investigation, um, but that's what I said on Wednesday, and, and that's what I think the right thing to do is. Uh, next, we go to the Times. Chris Meyer from the Times. Um, 
when it comes to mental health, Prime Minister, are, are, is what you're saying that there's an issue with the structure of the uh, welfare system and the health service, or are you saying there is a, Britain has a broader cultural problem with the way it thinks about mental health and particularly thinks that it can only have a medical solution? And in terms of the cost of this, obviously PIP was meant to reduce costs when it was introduced. Uh, it very much had the opposite effect. How will you avoid the same happening again? Will you include some kind of explicit commitment that yeah. these reforms have to reduce the cost of the system? Yeah, uh, it's a Chris, good, good question. So look, on, on mental health, I'll probably echo a little bit of what I've said you know, before. You know, what, now, of course, right, I, this is not about changing how clinicians, doctors, nurses treat mental health. Right? That is a question for them. Of course it would be they'll make clinical judgments about the type of support, treatments, interventions that people need. No one is saying anything different about that today. What we are saying is that the welfare system shouldn't over you know, what are the everyday challenges and worries of life and end up in a situation where just because someone has a mental health condition that they are kind of automatically assumed that they can't engage in any work when we know that work can be incredibly positive for that person. And I think, as I said, we, you know, if you look at the numbers, you know, half of people becoming inactive over the last year, citing depression and anxiety, you know, tripling in the number of people who have been signed off as sick in the last decade, you know, that doesn't quite strike us as right, strike me as right, right? And you can see that in the numbers. Um, now, of course, as I said, we'll get people the treatment and the support they need, and we're, we're doing, I think, a much better job on that than we've done in, in years past because of the change in the culture and the funding. Um, but the way the welfare system looks at this, I think, does need to change. Uh, and that's the point that we've been making. And whether we change the WCA gateway, change how PIP looks at this, so that we can support people with the treatment, that's how we'll, um, we'll get the change. And it, as a, particularly when it impacts young people, that's not something any of us uh, want to see, that, that lost generation of talent uh, with huge waste of potential. And then on PIP, look, I, you know, what my concern is that you know, increasingly you know, there is evidence to suggest and the PIP is not working the way that it was intended. It's been, look, it's been over a decade since it was introduced. It's reasonable that we look at it. And since the pandemic, what you've seen, um, that you know, I think there's probably, we need a more objective assessment process that it more accurately reflects what people's needs and extra costs. So I think the first thing, when we, you'll see this green paper next week when we publish it, but the first thing it will look at is how do we do that? How do we inject more objectivity into the process and link the assessment more closely to a person's condition and potentially require greater medical evidence to substantiate the claim. So that's the first thing that the consultation will, will look at. Um, the second thing will be moving away from this one-size-fits-all cash transfer model, right, which channels people instead to support that is tailored towards their individual needs, whether that be in-kind or service-based provision or referrals to alternative interventions. Um, so that's the second kind of bucket of reforms. And then the third thing is we'll look at, and you'll see in the paper, are options that could offer a better join up of local services and a simpler way for people to access all the things that are available uh, in their area. So look, those are the three elements of reform. Um, but as I said, the overall concern is, like I think we need to make sure that the system is not being exploited, it's not being a game, that it's more objective and rigorous, and we need to make sure that we're getting the right support tailored to the person in their circumstances. And as I said, you've got to start with, all conversations about PIP have to start with the fact that if we don't do anything, the PIP bill is forecast to increase by 50% over the next four years. Right? So whatever your views on the individual things that you might want to change, you've got to start with signing premises. If you don't do anything, it's a 50% increase in the PIP bill over just four years. And again, I don't think anyone will sit here and say, well, that seems justifiable, sensible, fair, um, or sustainable. Um, and so, so I think, as you see, our consultate our white paper next week, we'll set out those three areas that we're looking at for reform. Uh, I said, look, this is not about costs, right? Uh, as I said at the beginning, you know, if you just cared about costs, you can just freeze benefits, right? And some people have suggested that, right? That's a that's a simple way if you just care about saving money, but this is absolutely not about that, right? Of course, it is economically unsustainable, as I've said and gave you the numbers, £69 billion that we spend in this area, and so the PIP bill forecast to increase 50%. Of course, that is economically unsustainable, but this is not about that. As I said, you could just freeze benefits if you cared about money. This is about recognising how central and important work is to people's lives. Right. It's how, as I said, it gives you purpose, it gives you hope, it gives you belonging and identity. That's what I believe 
right? I started the statement talking about my belief in the value of hard work and how positive and transformative it is for people's lives beyond the financial benefit. And what's happening at the moment means that we are letting people down. Right? We are letting people down because the system is assuming they can't do anything and writing them off, and that's not right. It's not right for them, as well as obviously being financially uh, unsustainable. But fundamentally, this is about rewarding and recognizing the value of hard work to individuals, their families, and our country. And that's what our reforms will do. And lastly, if we go to the Express. Prime Minister, you mentioned about switching the uh, conviction of benefit fraudsters to the same way that we treat tax fraud. How many additional people do you think that's going to catch in the net? And on Iran, what message would you send to Tehran after these apparent strikes overnight? What should they do now to de-escalate tensions in the Middle East? Uh, look, so on, on fraud, what, what we've done, or what we will do, sorry, I mean, we've already done a bunch of things, data sharing powers that you saw the bus the other week. Um, but the important new thing today is uh, that what we will do is bring forward a new fraud bill in the new parliament. So a you know, new Conservative government will have a brand new fraud bill. Um, without getting into the micro specifics of it, there's a little bit of a, a, a difference and a gap between how HMRC is able to go after tax fraudsters and how DWP is able to go after welfare fraudsters. And we just want to make sure that DWP has all the same powers and tools that HMRC has. Uh, there's a range of things. There's information uh, gathering powers. There's the ability to make arrests and seizures. Uh, but there's also uh, introducing a new civil penalty so it can capture a wider group of people in the way that HMRC does and the way that DWP is a little bit limited at the moment in what it can do. Um, so look, that would be a new bill in the new parliament. You know, Mel's already started working on this and as I said we've saved hundreds of millions of pounds already. You saw the result of some of our enforcement work in the, the gang bus that I mentioned uh, the other day. Uh, but there's more we can do. Um, but again, this is not just about the money, it's about the sense of fairness that underpins the whole system. Right? Ultimately, we all believe in a welfare system that is compassionate, uh, but that compassion, that sustainability is based on people recognising that it's working well and working fairly. And if people see in their communities or elsewhere the system being exploited by fraudsters, it just undermines trust in the overall system, which is a bad thing, because we do need to have a strong welfare safety net so that those who genuinely need help do get that help. That's what Compassionate Britain is all about. Um, and I can't allow a system to sustain that is undermining consent for that system if people are able to um, exploit it. And, and when it comes to Iran, I would just echo what I said before, I've been very clear, you know, I just unequivocally condemn the dangerous escalation that uh, they displayed over the weekend, um, condemned it in the strongest possible terms, and that's why we participate in international effort over the weekend. Um, Right now, everyone, calm heads should prevail. Any significant escalation in the region is not what anyone needs. It wouldn't be in anyone's interest. Um, but as I said, we're working now to establish the facts and the details of, uh, of what happened overnight with our allies. Good. Thank you very much for your time.